everyone wants to create content that's going to advance essentially the sale of a product. And to do so, you know, we all understand the content must be engaging. Commercials, the, the world of commercials where you're forced to watch something that's dull and, and possibly embarrassing and just terrible content, those days are over, I think. Hi, I'm Mercedes Cardona, editor of Velocitize, and I am here at Velocitize Talks with Samantha Key. She is the chief revenue officer and president of She Knows Media. Mm -hmm. And since She Knows Media, we are going to talk media and publishing. And let's start with the really obvious Exciting. question. Early March, She Knows Media changed hands, and it was acquired by Penske Media Corporation, a parent of Women's Wear Daily and Variety and a number of... Uh, Rolling Stone now, yep. And yep. Uh, so, you know, tell us, what was the, I'm assuming, strategic reason for going with that and not another VC or another type of company? Yeah, well, we're thrilled. We just announced last week the acquisition, and I think what what is really exciting about this particular opportunity is that Penske Media has such incredible um, respect for quality content and they put content first in a media environment where you know not a lot of companies are doing that they have to you know by necessity go for reach and and headline based clicks and the math that allows for incremental inventory at a low cost and you can sometimes go a little too far down that path I think and and not give credence to or primary attention to the content you're producing and the sourcing and the research and the journalism. Um, and so Penske Media is really committed to that quality content. So for us, yes, it's a strategic acquisition. Private equity is not the place for us to grow, which is where we were, we were owned uh, up until last week. And um, VC is a very hard path for media right now. So it's kind of perfect and we're really we're really happy and relieved that it's done. And speaking of content uh, and trust, I mean, how do, how can you restore trust to media in a time of fake news mm -hmm. and polarization? And, uh, you know, you're needing to uh, get consumers to invest either time or money. Mm -hmm. Would you have to put your content behind a paywall to guarantee that it's authentic or... Uh, are there other measures to restore the trust of the public? Well, I, this is something I'm I'm passionate about, but also um, vexed by because there isn't an easy answer, and it's become really easy to produce content that is 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 full of lies, full of um, negative, divisive um, sort of points of view. Platforms where the majority platforms, meaning Facebook, YouTube and so on, are uh, not accountable to FTC regulations for the content. They're not producing the content. So they're providing the platform, but they are not um, accountable to the content itself. That's a dramatic shift from what we've seen in media up until, you know, very recently. So um, so people can say whatever they want. They can, they can promote fake news. They can um, produce not just divisive, but straight up racist, sexist, anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. xenophobic content, and no one can tell them to take it down. Um, so it's it's a really interesting and f troubling uh, time in media, but there's also an enormous amount of opportunity. I feel there's a way of coming back to uh, respected sources and to um, credible reporting, and I think we've gone quite a ways in one direction where all content is equal and some you know and and there's not enough attention to the quality of the reporting i think we as consumers readers um, investors are coming back to wanting to understand the source the perspective i hope wanting greater depth in our content consumption so there is no easy fix there is no ad tech solution right now that can truly monitor for quality and for truth mm -hmm. so you have to be part of a media company that is um, endemically accountable to that. And that's where we're really fortunate to be joining the Penske Media Corporation because that is a place where content is deeply respected. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the reverse of those negatives is the positive of advocacy yes, and purpose. Yes, yes, yes. And, um, I mean, you have some programs like The Pitch, which mm -hmm. supports women entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, we've seen a lot of brands embrace the idea of brand purpose mm -hmm. and, and communicating that brand purpose in their advertising. So can you now be a neutral brand or do consumers demand that you take stands on issues that you show what you stand for, mm -hmm. or they tune you out. Yeah, well, I think that's, I agree with you. There's the negative um, sort of outcomes, unintended outcomes of full access to publishing, but and there are incredible positives. The women we work with through Blog Her and through our specific program, The Pitch, are looking to build their own small businesses. They're looking to build entrepreneurial um, entities. They produce content about their passions and they get paid for it. And um, it allows many, many people to produce profitable enterprises by publishing um, inspiring, interesting, high utility, service oriented content. So um, I think that is, is the upside and where we focus our efforts is in helping uh, entrepreneurs to use the tools that are available to them now um, within, you know, the frame of technology. Um, to build their, their personal brands, to build their audience, to build their um, commerce uh, conversions, uh, to increase transactions, and to and, and companies, to your point, there is such transparency now that companies do need to vote their values when it comes to the, the brands, the spaces that they associate themselves with, the areas that they advertise into. And if you're supporting as an advertiser, even unwittingly, if you are supporting an enabling fake news, that will negatively impact your brand eventually. It might take us a minute to catch all of that um, adja negative adjacency, but you know, great brands are not going to allow themselves to be next to poor, negative, falsely reported uh, content. And so I think it's, it, we are seeing companies align with the pitch for us, align with Blog Her, align with the uh, Hatch, which is our digital literacy program for kids. Brands are hopping on these opportunities to really do good, to use social media to advance uh, values they care about. Um, and they have to walk the walk as well. You can't just sort of get into the femvertising space um, and, you know, promote, you know, women's businesses um, because it's trendy. You have to actually, behind the scenes, be addressing your practices and policies, um, the composition of your board, um, the boards that CEOs sit on outside of their own companies. We're seeing a lot of activity there where CEOs of, of major companies are stepping off of boards. There was, it was very public with Uber, mm -hmm. but um, because, because they're concerned about the behaviors that are being exhibited within those corporations. So I'd say there's an incredible smattering of activity where we can see corporations and brands really endeavoring to uh, allow their values or their brand equity to flow all the way through from kind of their boardrooms to the messaging that they're uh, conveying to their consumer base. And we're fortunate to have the kinds of programs within She Knows Media that allow for that continuity, you know, to be a brand and who supports women and to be advertising, building your business within the frame of mm -hmm. women entrepreneurs. So speaking of continuity and, uh, you know, given your background where you've been a CMO, you've been in media, you've been in both sides or several sides of the <laughs> industry, where do you see advertising and marketing going in these days where you have publishers who do advertising, advertising mm -hmm. agencies doing content, marketers doing both advertising and content yeah. labs. So, you know, how do you learn to work together at a time when everybody's in everybody else's business? Well, I think it's a really, I, I love this, this contemplation because, um, it is interesting. In the room, when, when thinking about advertising, you have publishers, you have platforms, um, you have agencies, you have, including their creative teams, and then you have brands who also have creative teams. Everybody has a creative team. So there's a lab at the publisher, there's a lab at the platform, you know, mm -hmm. the, upon which the content's being distributed. There's a lab at the agency, of course, and there's a lab at the publisher, uh, I'm sorry, at the brand. So everyone wants to create content that's going to advance essentially the sale of a product and to do so you know we all understand the content must be engaging commercials 
the, the world of commercials where you're forced to watch something that's dull and, and mm -hmm. possibly embarrassing <laughs> and just terrible content, those days are over, I think. Um, you know, I, I love watching the advertising innovation that even happens within Super Bowl or Olympics or uh, Academy Awards. But uh, I think we all know the content has to be good. Um, who produces the content is, is, is up in the air right now. Who's best qualified to produce the content that's going to engage a certain audience is also up in the air. Um, publishers know their audiences very well, so you could argue that they're in the right position. Brands know their brand equity and their consumer really well, so you could argue that they are, they are the right ones. And then agencies have the creative competency, so maybe, so they likewise um, are, are well qualified. But it's, it's a bit of a hodgepodge right now. Um, and I think that we'll see that shake out. Those who are good at producing content, whether it's a Vice or a Vox or a, or a She Knows Media, will I think be producing more and more content that's geared towards uh, bringing out a brand's equity while simultaneously telling a story that's interesting. Because you can't be one or the other. You can't be an ad that is uninteresting to a consumer because you have to earn their, their, their attention. Um, and then I think beyond that, we're going to see, um, I think advertising will come back to actually supporting the production of high utility for their users. So um, they have to provide service or they have to be really great content, like amuse me or inspire me or, you know, or educate me. So I think that e-learning is coming around as a brand sponsored platform where, you know, if you're a brand that... Uh, purports to really support women entrepreneurs, you're producing utilities and e-learning platforms for those entrepreneurs. And that's brought to you by American Express, or that's provided by FedEx. And I think that's really cool. I think there's, because it's actually moving the culture forward while simultaneously building a relationship between brand and consumer. So cool stuff all around. So speaking of utilities, can you think of any particular technology that's going to just revolutionize media or at the very least disrupt it in the next three to five years? I could probably come up with a lot of terrible ideas, but the ones that the things that I'm seeing really grab traction with consumers and actually adequately advance brands. So if we're in the framework of, of what's going to innovate within advertising and digital advertising, I think that um, I do come back to e-learning utilities that are mobily um, optimized so that there is sort of a perpetual opportunity to be with a brand, not because it's cool advertising or because I love Nike, but rather because Nike is actually providing fitness utility to me that I need and that I want and that I covet, and it's free because <clears throat> because Nike wants my attention and wants that relationship. They also are going to be, um, and are, brands are ingesting an enormous amount of data. So their ability to serve us is that much greater. There's geo, there's geo. so within a certain framework when you want to make, some, make a product, discount a product for a very specific zip code or a very specific kind of consumer um, within, again, the framework of CRM, um, you can just do so much more. It's not like rewards programs where there's, you know, three levels and there's mm -hmm. platinum and there's um, silver and what have you. It's really individually opt uh, optimizing your transactional sales model against an individual consumer. I think that's going to be very interesting. There's just so much more data that allows you to address not a segment of consumers, but an individual consumer based on her consumer behavior. So I think that consumer behavior and overall behavioral economics are finally, we're figuring out what to do with the data so that we can really engage more deeply and serve more deeply our consumers. I also think on demand <clears throat> is clearly, I mean, between Amazon, Uber, and myriad others, consumers are expecting and Gen Z will expect 100% on demand. They're not going to expect to wait. Um, they're going to expect you know, the best price and receipt of product within not days, but hours, I think. So <clears throat> the solving to on demand um, product delivery products or service, um, I think will will continue to, to, to break open. Um, messaging, I think messaging platforms are, are already the way we communicate, but I think that they will learn to do more and more for us. So speaking of the future, 
and what comes next. I saw somewhere where you spoke of Chino's as a post-social company, right. and I can't let you leave without explaining what you mean by that. Well, I think what we're seeing, and again, this is kind of a, a return to quality, I hope, and um, understanding sources. Um, a, a Forbes writer referred to us as post-social. That wasn't my line, but I think that idea is that social platforms are, are tossing content around um, in a really fast-paced way. Um, depth of articles is, you know, a, a little bit under assault by social distribution in some ways. You know, you read the headline, you understand that my friend wants me to see this, or it shows up in your feed, and you're like, cool, 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 got the headline, got the blurb, move along. We're, the majority of our traffic is through search, and search-based traffic is highly intentional. Um, Google has, has, has solved to any mismatch between what I'm searching for and what I receive. Their algorithms have allowed the most relevant content to ensure it finds the searcher. So I think that when we, when <laughs> Tony from Forbes said post-social, I think he was referring to our reliance and, and investment in, in search mm -hmm. over, I don't need social uh, traffic back to my site. It's uh, the reliance upon, sir, I'm sorry, on social for many of my friends in the industry has ended up crushing their businesses. Mm -hmm. An algorithm changes and their main distribution uh, platform suddenly is, is not providing that distribution in, an, in, in, the, in the way that it was expected. So for us, providing articles that really reflect what our readers want to see and videos similarly so that we're not just you know, we're not just being passed around on social, which we love, and we use social as a brand building space, but it's not what I rely on for traffic. My reliance on traffic is old, good old fashioned email and search, and those are far less vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Build an experience platform and people will come yeah, for it. Right, exactly. Great. So we've been here with Samantha Ski Thanks of She Knows me. Media, <laughs> and uh, we look forward to see what comes next. Thank you. Okay, thank you.